I nominate Mandy to run the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Bridget. I'll second that. All in favor? Sure. Aye. Aye. Um, okay, it is 5.04, uh, calling a meeting to order. Um, Wait, here, hold on. We got somebody? Ooh, ooh, Peter's iPad. Oh, iPad. Good evening, Eric. everyone. Good evening, Peter. I'm having severe technical problems over in the Adirondacks, so I apologize. And what I mean severe, I'm now here uh, only on my iPad and I can't bring up any of the documents we're supposed to talk about tonight. So I'm gonna need help. Help we with a capital, that. help with a capital H. Do you and want I, also, I also don't have the agenda in front of me. So do you want, do you want, uh, Randy, to run the meeting, we we've already uh, nom be, we've nominated him and yeah. seconded it and that voted it. That's because it's going to be a nightmare from here. I'm sorry. Okay. So we'll just carry on. Okay. Um, Where are you now? We just barely called the meeting uh, to order. Uh, we took a vote for me to run the meeting from here in your absence. Um, and then we were Good. just- when you're all set, I can sign off and have a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> you're here now, you're trapped. <laughs> okay, I apologize to, uh, I apologize to everyone, but I am here now, yes. Uh, first item on the agenda this, morning, uh, this evening is approving the minutes of May 16th, our regular select board um action likely uh do we have any any motions to approve those meeting minutes or any revisions i move that we accept the uh, minutes of the may uh 16th 2023 regular select board uh meeting i'll second, I'll second. Oh. Sorry, you. you got it uh, before we vote, I just want to point out one clarifying uh, point that I asked Sarah to clear up. Um, it was just language around uh, the boots, and I don't know if folks saw the revised minutes, but that was just today. So I just want to call that out. It was just clarifying that it was uh, one pair of boots up to $200 as long as they passed the uh, standard that was previously contained in the policy and that whether road crew wanted to go with a lighter pair of boots, they could, or as long as they met the policy. So with that, um, we've got a uh, Victor made the motion, uh, Bridget seconded, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We're good to go there. Um, reviewing and amending uh, and approving the agenda for June 6th, select board meeting. Action likely. I just wanna, since Peter, since you're not here, and you can, didn't get my documents, <clears throat> we just amended to include a renewal of the dog stray holding contract with Central Vermont Humane Society. They just sent it this afternoon. Okay? Yeah. All right, that's, that's how it's amended. See ya. Any motions for approving the agenda? As amended. I move uh, to accept the June 6, 2023 select board meeting agenda as amended. You have a second? I'll second this time. Okay. Here. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? We are good to go. Um, Reviewing and approving a proposal for an upcoming townwide property appraisal. Action likely. Uh, we have Shelly Desjardins here um, representing the listers. Yeah, and uh, we had spoke a little bit about the H-480 that did pass with legislative. Um, there's a lot of kinks in it, so I talked to the district advisor to make sure it's still okay to go forward to um, hire someone herself, and he said yes, because he thinks it's gonna be a number of years before it's implemented and there are probably changes before that. 
And I, as I said before, when uh, Annette was here with me, uh, never came in low. And they're the system that we have, uh, that we use right now, so it's going to be more cost savings for us to continue with Nemeric. And they came in lower than anybody else, and we only got one other bid because there's so few appraisers out there right now. Okay. So that that be your official recommendation is yes. to move forward with the Nemeric proposal? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have questions for, for Shelly at all before we try to put this to a motion? Peter, you're on mute, I think. Peter, you're 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 on mute, Peter. Sorry, I'm I'm sorry. I just don't think we have any choice, unfortunately. So I agree. Okay. I add that you asked me to check into how much money we had in the coffers towards this, and currently we have fifty-two thousand dollars. Um, and this year we received about 9,000. Um, it varies from year to year, but that was this year's payment. Um, so there's 52 there right now. So, and this came in at a hundred and something, was it? It was 105. 105. 105. So it's definitely going to be something that we'll have to budget extra for. For next year? For the next two years, probably. So they, they had said to start making payments in 2024, if I remember right. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else have any comments, questions, discussion? I'll move approval. Okay, we've got a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Victor seconded. All those in favor of approving uh, the proposal from Nemeric? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are clear to approve the Nimerick proposal. All right, moving right along. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I think that the board approves the money and uh, the listers sign the contract. Does that sound right to you, Shelley? I think so, yeah. Okay. I'll, so I'm you, gonna, I'll, I'll call Nimerick tomorrow. You, but we don't, you don't have to designate somebody. Yeah. I think that's the way it works. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, meeting with representatives from Vermont Emergency Management to consider the following. Approving a buyout of 28 Rich Road for $214,998, of which 75% will be paid for by FEMA funds, and of which 25% will be paid for by a matching grant authorizing a town signatory at the June 29th, 2023 closing and clarification of future reimbursements for asbestos con consultation, possible asbestos remediation and deconstruction. Action likely. And I think we have Lisa here with uh, Vermont Emergen uh, Emergency Management. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Very excited. Um, about moving this project along. Okay. Um, do any of the board members have questions, comments, concerns? The, I guess the question I have is, and I've read over the, I read over all the documents that that Sarah sent, but just going through the money and how the money works and where it's coming from and what our what our risk, if any, is, would be helpful, I think, and good to get it into the minutes. Yeah, and, and you do have the packet that I sent to Sarah I that been provided. Okay. Yeah. Um, may I, so in looking at page three, are there specific questions regarding the funding sources that you'd like me to clarify? So just to be clear, the, the problem is that I read those documents, I saw them, but I don't have them up in front of me. So if you could just quickly go through that, that would be helpful for me. Certainly. Certainly. Um, okay, so as of this point in time, we have an anticipated total project cost of $259,100. You, um, the Middlesex has $20,000 from Vermont Disaster Recovery Fund, a federal award, which the document is attached to the packet, 
from FEMA for $179,325. And then a local match letter, which is also part of the packet, indicating that VEM's share of the match, which is a 25%, I'm sorry, share of the project at 25% is $59,775 which equals the total anticipated project cost to date as of today of $259,100. Any questions about that column? Got that, thank you. Okay. What I tried to do because um, Sarah was asking some very good anticipatory questions was wanting to point out, which is the second column of that same page, is that FEMA has already indicated in those award documents that they're anticipating potential additional $20,000 to be awarded in federal funds once Middlesex is able to get um, bid documents or a contract from for the asbestos and the demolition. So there's already an additional anticipated increase in the FEMA funding of $20,000. Any questions on that? The only question is, I believe we're anticipating that those costs are going to be substantially higher than that. Which brings me to the next point and is part <laughs> of our document. Vermont Emergency Management has committed to paying the match requirement and the funds needed to complete the project. And what we tried to indicate in the documents that we sent is we can't just make up a number, right? So we have $8 million, which was allotted for match funding through Vermont Emergency Management, and we've only spent two. So we have $6 million remaining in that general fund to use for match. So we're committed to paying the match once you have an idea on how much that match needs to be in order to cover the remaining expenses of the grant. So the bottom line is, and I know we've been through this before, but you truly believe that there is no cost risk associated with this project for the town of Middlesex, correct? I mean, there's correct. always some risk, we understand. Right, that. and again, I wanna be very careful and cautious. If you, the first step is to actually find out how much it is going to cost you. And then Sarah will turn that into us and we will increase the match by that amount. Right. And I guess the other question which came up in, in looking over these documents is the time deadlines that are built into the project. And will yep. we be able to meet those time deadlines? Correct. And what the process is, do we need now to try and get additional time or do we start and then ask for additional time? How do we do that? Let me address that. And I'll, I'll say this, the question, I think the end question for the town is, you know, what happens if, um, and I can tell you that we've just never had a case where <laughs> the, the project does not get completed. As far as a time frame, we are not yet at the time when we would request a, um, an extension from FEMA because we need to have an idea on how much of an extension needs to be asked for. Um, I, I will definitely answer more questions on this, but I will say in that ordinary, it is part of the ordinary course of business for a project to request additional time to complete the project. And if you'll bear with me one moment, because I wanna give you this date, VEM has till September 1st to request an extension to that period of performance. Yeah. And so like I said, and, and I think I did address, and please, if there's more questions, but on that first page, the demolition, once we know how much more time you could potentially need to do the demolition, we will ask for that extension first of all, of the period to demo the building, because it needs to be done within 90 days, and then secondarily for any increase or um, advancement of the period of performance deadline. This is also not the only project we have under 4330 under this grant round. So we're anticipating 
the possibility of asking for additional time to complete these projects. I'm just afraid, really afraid, that we're out looking for an asbestos abatement contractor and a demolition contractor, and we've got a 90-day deadline. We don't know. We haven't tried yet, but I'm just anticipating right out of the box it's going to be very challenging to get somebody. Well, and I, I think the challenge for me is I want to, I, I understand, and I want to honor that question, and I don't know how much more I can say than in the ordinary course of business, this is what we do. We request this extension, um, and it's not going to be unreasonably withheld. FEMA, neither FEMA, VEM, or the town of Middlesex um wants to not demolish this home um i don't know if this gives you just a little bit more um we're not going to do this in this case but on prior projects going back years we were actually also allowed to ask for what's called a retroactive extension to demolition which fema approved so like i said we don't anticipate any difficulty with there being a um, an approval of any request to extend the demolition. Okay. And if, again, if it makes you feel uncomfortable after the closing, if you would rather that we request that um, extension and demolition immediately, because that kind of gives you a little bit more, um, a, a little bit more feelings of, okay, this is moving forward. I'd be more than happy to do that for you also. I don't know how others feel. Uh, I think we can, assuming we agree to go ahead with this this evening, we can we can get right to work and see if we can line people up, and we'll know very quickly if they're telling us, you know, it's going to be next year before we can even look at this. Then we're going to be coming right back to you and saying, okay, we need that extension. Yeah, and again, I I believe me, I don't want to oversell anything, but and I know that we live in unprecedented times. Um, but I will say we've we've just never seen that. Um, so like I said, I don't want to dismiss it all because a lot of this is beyond all of our control. Um, it's just not something that is normally anticipated happening. Sarah, have you had any conversations with any contractors thus far? I have not had any because I didn't want to start this process until we uh, actually went through with the closing. And also this closing has happened pretty fast. You know, we there was a delay, and then it was just a few weeks ago. But that it was like it was going forward. So I don't really have an idea of what our timeline is. So, is there a reason that this closing needs to happen on the time frame that it does? Can we go seek proposals and understand what this time frame is? I mean, so my concerns are, you know, the town being burdened with any cost whatsoever. Um, you know, and uh, understanding that we may receive an extension and it's probable that we'll receive an extension it's not guaranteed um and if the closing moves forward and all of a sudden we do find that deconstruction can't happen within the time frame that's allowed and there isn't an extension granted you know can I, i'm sorry can i interject what fema is not going to allow the building to stand i mean fema is not going to say no now you have to keep the building um, we also have Flood Resilient Communities Fund, which is a state program, which is always our backup to move from the FEMA to um, to the Flood Resilient Communities Fund. So, and I'm sorry to interject. I just, I, again, I hear you guys, and I know that that's a great concern. Um, in all of the time that hazard mitigations existed, FEMA has never stopped a project and then kept the home standing in the flood zone because the intent is to remove the building from the flood zone. Any questions on that? No, if I get that. I'm, my, my understanding is as long as we haven't accepted any money, we can back out. Is that true? Like if this just turns out to be a nightmare and we can't get an extension, but we haven't started the project, we're not obligated to go ahead with the project, are we? Not from well, the side of FEMA, but you do have a homeowner that went out and found a new home. And to back to, and I'm sorry, I can't tell because your names are not on the screen. Um, the select board member who had just recently spoken to ask why the closing date, because a homeowner has found a new home that she's purchasing. 
Well, she's been sitting on her hands for what, two years? So I understand that. I, I real believe me, I want this to happen. I mm -hmm. just I just share Randy's concern. And I remember uh, we did what was we did another project a couple of years ago. We had all the same all the same concerns and issues and everything worked out fine. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just a little scary for us. I'm sure you understand. We're not trying to be impolite or rude or nasty. No, or anything like that. I guess I guess the thing is, and again, where I'm coming from is I don't know how much more I can that that our program can guarantee, except that we've we have funding for everything and we will request all the extensions if necessary. And it's everybody's goal to complete the project. And then we have the Flood Resilient Communities Fund, which is a state funded program that would be like that last resort. Um, but I, I guess the bet, I know you don't know me from uh, anyone else, but um, we're not anticipating any difficulties. We have no concerns about the project, where it's at or where we see it's going. Um, and we don't have any, any difficulties that we're anticipating in the completion of the project. Dorinda? Um, yeah. <clears throat> I have a concern with this being two days from our year end. Um, that I do not want to see us in a deficit situation to end our year. Um, so this is not an approved thing that money that the townspeople have approved for us to expend any kind of money towards this. So, you know, whatever, you know, if for some reason that money's not in our account come June 29th, um, I don't think we should be signing anything. If I may, I'm sorry, on page one, um, I did think that I addressed that. All of the, 100% of the closing funds will be to the town prior to closing. So you have zero dollars that, except for there's a $13 tax adjustment, which I don't want to chase that rabbit too far. Um, but if you look at page one under closing funds, We've already, the HUD that you have, once that's signed and submitted, the, the VEM is sending you, the town, those funds for closing. So you have no money that the town's expending at closing at all. Well, it said that it could take up to two to three weeks. I just, you know, there's the- No, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry, two to three weeks to go from us to you all but you don't close unless you have that fund. That's actually um, one of the services that we provide is rather than having the town seek a reimbursement, we actually do an advance of funds in anticipation of closing. So no, you would not close unless the money is there. And all future expenses we have to pay up front and then we get reimbursed? That is the standard course of business. If you guys would like to request that we do so otherwise, um, Sarah can just send us an email requesting that um, and we can, we'll need a, um, an invoice, a clear invoice, and we can check with finance to see if they'll approve that. Is if that's, if, if is that's, my if, correct, Dorinda, that, that the last time we did this, or maybe it's Sarah, um, we had no trouble getting the funds that came in a timely manner, as promised. That was before my time. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember a problem. I just want to be clear what we what triggered Lisa. What triggers the um, uh, the re release of the two to three week process releasing funds? What needs to be signed? Is it anything that needs to be signed tonight by the board that's here? Um, somebody needs to sign that financial reimbursement form. Okay. That, that, that accompany the HUD. Yep. And we can do that now. Can we do that now, even though we've got a little wonkiness on the um, on the tax issue? Yep, yep. Because that'll be handled, That that's handled uh, what we call outside of closing. Um, that allows us to go ahead and get the advanced funds. So yes, so just to re, just to, the, when looking at that HUD, VEM is sending 100% of those funds. So I'd also say if it makes everybody feel just kind of a little bit a little bit like, okay, who's got skin in the game? VEM is sending you our 50,000 plus 
no, I'm sorry, not 50,000, our, our, our 25% match, we're, we're investing that in this project and FEMA is investing the 75%. So after closing, if you look at it this way, both VEM and FEMA actually have the money invested and we have a greater desire to see um, the whole project be completed. Yeah, I mean, if the town's not releasing any money, it does make it feel better that, you know, we're less at risk. Yes, and again, I please understand that it's so hard not being there. I really, all these questions are good, really good, diligent questions. Um, I just, and I want to make sure that I'm addressing everything. Uh, we do this in the normal course of business, so I know it's easier for me to say that, like, I know Sarah's put a lot into this and it has been a couple of years a coming, but from our perspective, everything is happening exactly as anticipated and as it should. Um, if one thing I will throw out, I can't guarantee, but if the concern um, to our select board um, who brought up, hey, we don't wanna have to expend money, like I said, you can handle the closing. And then once you know how much things are gonna cost, asked us if we would consider doing um, an advance of funds for it. And that's an allowable practice, typically? It's not, uh, it's typical. not typical. It's, it's, it's allowable. allowable. It's, it's not, not typical. typical. Yeah, I don't want to be the... We, nor, nor, <laughs> you don't want to promise anything you can't deliver. For, you could ask for it, and under the circumstances, if it, if it makes everybody feel better about moving forward, um, we would recommend to finance that that be allowed. So Lisa, can I just ask another question while I got everybody sure. here? So yeah. what you would like to do is have the Department of Public Safety, the Hazard, Hazard Mitigation Program, this FEMS, this is the one that they need to sign the, the, the 200, does, this, this is the one that Cheryl corrected the, the figure that we'd already spent third quarter from 6-1-2023 to 6-6-2023. This is the date that you sent, this was sent to us, the financial yeah, report. I'm sorry, when you, when you said, what did she correct on that? She corrected a, uh, um, it's a, t a legal fee we haven't, that hasn't been included in this, that I was saving with the other title. Yeah, we read that outside, that was, okay. Um, I had emailed her back and said, we handle that outside of. Um, so did you edit the financial reimbursement form? Do I, I just need to know, is that what they need to sign tonight? Is this what, what yeah. gets everything started? I will edit it right now. Yeah. Okay, good. But I'm sorry, I, I'm very, very hard to do this remotely. Um, I do wanna make sure for those that had concerns and questions, um, if you still have that concern or question, can we continue to discuss that? or do you kind of feel better kind of seeing the whole project and how it all works together? I'm all set. I'm, I'm ready sure. to go. I don't have any more questions. I'd make the motion. Bridget, did you have any questions, concerns, comments? No, I think that uh, Randy, your questions and uh, Peter as well addressed everything I was thinking. So I heard Victor make a motion. Um, I'm assuming to approve, right. Victor. Right, correct. I make the motion to approve the uh, the uh, buyout. buyout of, uh, what is it, 228 Rich Road? 28. 28 Rich Road. You need to authorize. I'll second that. Okay. Authorize a signatory. And I'll authorize a signatory for the for the closing on the 29th. Okay. Uh, two separate motions, okay, Sarah? Yep. Okay. Um, so we have a motion from Victor to approve the buyout of 28 Rich Road. Um, sounds like Peter seconded that. Yes. Um, we should probably establish the dollar amount in that motion of $214,998. Um, all those who uh, who approve? Actually, it's $215,715, right? No, I have $214,998. That's no, what's in the form. Lisa? It's, it's, it's $215,728 which is equal to the amount VEM will be sending. 
the other side is what the what goes to the seller. So when you look at the HUD, when you look at the left hand side, the two fifteen seven twenty eight. I see two okay. fifteen, but I don't see seven twenty eight. So to be clear, Victor put forward a motion to approve the purchase, the buyout of twenty eight Rich Road, two hundred fifteen thousand seven hundred twenty eight dollars. Peter, you still hold your second? Yes. Um, it's been moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion has been approved. Uh, we also need a motion to approve a signatory for the Closing on June 29th, 2023. Peter. And there's one for yeah, that. I'm happy to What'd you say? Too. There's one for that form. Someone to sign that form tonight, too. Well, actually, right? what I'm going to ask the board to do is there are going to be a lot of financial reporting forms that we have to go through starting now. So I would, could you authorize, Lisa, while well, I've got you here, may I see this for a second? Um, so, so signature of subrecipient authorizing official is does that ha who does that have to be Lisa does that have to be it can be anyone anyone that the town gives the ability to sign so would I could you guys would you consider um, making Dorinda the treasurer the sub the uh, authorizing official since these are all financial reporting forms as the treasurer she'll probably have to sign a check too right she'll I don't she'll have to sign a whole bunch of stuff yeah. does that Lisa is that what more yeah. towns do do they make the treasurer? Yes, yeah, at times what'll happen is at closing, you're, you'll give one check to the attorney's office, the or wire transfer. You'll get the money to the attorney, and the attorney will cut all the checks at closing. Um, right. But you also need to consider there'll be the deed, the warranty deed, and then other um, forms at closing. I think that the board has just authorized uh, Peter, our chair, to be the signatory of those. I'm talking about the for the financial for forms yeah. going forward. Sorry, yes, yes, you can have the treasurer. Okay, and good. That is thanks. kind of in the normal course of business. It's usually the treasurer or a town clerk or town administrator. Great. Is That's... the treasurer okay with that? Yes. Good. Did anyone make a motion? Uh, so, do you guys made it first? You have a motion on Peter signing the, um, on Peter signing the, all the closing documents and they need a second on that and then also authorizing to to sign everything yeah okay thank you. so let's let's move forward with the first motion to have peter sign documents at the closing so moved uh we had victor make the motion do we have a second bridget I'll second uh all those in favor aye aye, aye. any oppose congratulations peter you're gonna sign all the documents at a closing um we also need to uh move to make uh dorinda an authorized signatory for any financial forms uh moving forward through this process so moved i'll second all those in favor aye aye aye, aye. any opposed congratulations dorinda you're Thanks. signing, <laughs> signing everything. Great. Um, and I believe that that brings this matter to rest. Sure. May, may I just say thank you very much. I, I hope I answered all the questions, even though it's moving forward. I do think it's very important that um, you all have confidence and, and understand kind of those next steps. So Sarah does a fantastic job of representing the town um, and asking the right questions. But in the meantime, if you guys feel we're almost done, but I, if you guys feel like you have additional questions or you want clarification, please feel free to reach out and ask. Okay. Thank you very much, Lisa, and I appreciate your patience and understanding. Oh, like I said, not a problem at all. It, when you're not in the course of business of doing things like this, it, it's there's a lot of things you're concerned about. That's why I said I didn't want to be flippant at all, but I'm like, we're not worried. Like, we, we, you guys are doing a great job. So, um, but well, thank you all. I'm going to bow out and let you get on to your remaining business. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate your time. Um, highway department. 
Uh, update on road issues. We don't have any. Don't really have any. We've been ditching up on the Upper Barnett and uh, Upper Sunnybrook. Almost done that. And then we've been moving on to uh, Shady Row. Where? Shady Row. What's up? Uh, we did get our uh, yellow uh, center lines painted by the state of Vermont on Three Mile Bridge Road and on Center Road. Um, not sure over in Route 12. I don't think so. I didn't see them. I didn't see any. And uh, I've, I have no idea why they stopped where they did on Center Road, uh, but they uh, left out, what, from just beyond J.J. Uh, um, Van Dietz's uh, home to, uh, to the end of it. <laughs> I don't know why. Ran out of paint, maybe. <laughs> That's the only thing I can think of. Um, yeah, Eric's... Um, uh, we're checking. We're checking on the. You did. Were you able to check on the truck again? I haven't heard back. I sent him okay. an email. I have and then you've you 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 have met with a, one person on a loader. So far, on yeah. The escalator, so far. Okay. And then, has there been any progress? I haven't been over for three or four days on the on the speed limit sign and shady rail. Is that working yet, or? Uh, I have not been over there. Okay, the last time I was like three or four days, yeah. it wasn't. So. Yeah, they're probably still not then. Okay, we have issues I, with that. I think or, it's something with the uh, the uh, the charging of the battery. Right. Well, there's not getting enough sun. Or? Yep. So I think I have to move it. Move the we're, solar we're talk, panel. We're talking about our sixteen thousand dollars set of signs in Putnamville. One of them, the one on the. Montpelier side isn't working right at this time. But. Hasn't been working for a while. Right. I believe it's a solar issue. Yeah. Solar. No, no. East to west here. East to west. Yes, it's, and it's not. But anyways, we will follow up <laughs> it's on it. north. <laughs> so guys, I have, a, I have a, a quick question, and uh, it comes to mind only because I'm over in the I'm over in the Adirondacks and they're doing their roadside mowing. And I thought, huh, I wonder where we are with our roadside July. So where are we? Middle of July. We have it scheduled but to come. We, what's our plan? We have the tractor coming like we did last year. So we're ready to tractor, but our guys are going to do the mowing. Correct. Same okay. as last year. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything that concerns you about that, Peter? No. Oh, okay. I just, you know, we've we've had a lot of discussion over the years about, you know, one mowing, two mowings. Do we try and buy our own machine? Do we rent one? All that. So I just was curious where we had come down on that. Okay. Thank you. Right. No, we need to do the roadside mowing, no doubt. That's all I got. That's all I have. Okay. Um, and Mr. Russ Bennett from Galaxy of Yes to discuss possible survey of residents likely to be affected by a potential municipal water system about their potable and wastewater needs, action possible. Okay. Good evening, Russ. Good evening. Should I sit up here a little closer, maybe? Sure. There's a microphone right there so that the uh, camera can, can pick um, you up. And... Uh, what time is it? It's a little You're early. early. It's a yeah. bit early. Yeah, well, I can give you a little for, for a Craig um, from Otter Creek Engineering is supposed to come on at about 6 o'clock. Um, he couldn't be here in, um, in person because he had a, a child thing. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to begin to talk about was, um, as we as we'd mentioned before, we know we, we're pretty sure we have the capacity to have enough water for the town of Middlesex to have a municipal system if it wanted to. And um, <clears throat> we, the Galaxy folks, uh, and Rob Napier, um, would help. Um, we, we, would ha we have to spend some money to have a municipal, to have our own system anyway. And it seems to me that we can probably 
if we have to spend that money, I think we might be able to come up with the match or most of the match that a town would need to have a municipal system, and then you wouldn't have to come up with that yourself and sort of help you guys get the grants. So one of the first steps is um, for you guys, to, if you think it's a good idea, to think about surveying your population. Does anybody th else think this is a good idea? Um, and what do they think about it? And um, so one, your service area, whatever that might be, and the general population as well. So um, Craig will talk about what the general, it, how long does it take to, put, to build a system, you know, all of this kind of stuff. What's the process? But I had brought some, um, and I can pass these around, preliminary rough survey kind of things that they, because they do this all the time, Otter Creek Engineering, municipal um, water systems and sewer systems. So I can send these around for you guys. Oh, you got one. Yeah. Everybody got one. Yeah. All right. So we, we have them. The other oh, we do. may not have them. But Good for you. Well, here you go. These are not meant to be anything. We don't have an agenda, you know, that's hidden. <laughs> Uh, in any way, and anybody else want one to see? Thank you. Um, other than we want to be good uh, neighbors, good citizens. Yeah. Um, so they're sort of. So Russ, Peter Hood. Um, I read over the material that you sent, the sample surveys. Yeah. And I guess I have two questions, and maybe you can maybe you can answer them, and maybe we need to wait for the wait for the engineer, but. Uh, right. One of my questions was, I just know, having been through this before years ago, the first thing people are going to want to know is, A, what it's going to cost the town, and B, what's it going to cost them in terms of a usage charge or however it's going to work. And I know this is just meant to be a very preliminary survey saying, you know, I guess if we could supply water to you for a for a reasonable cost, would you be interested in having a community water system and having fire protection and all of this just to see what people would say? But I think a lot of people are going to be reluctant to say yes if they have no idea about what the cost might be. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful somehow we can come up with some tentative, uh, at least tentative rough back of the page estimates of what that is. And I think the other question was, or the other question for me is, um, you know, getting some kind of idea. And I, I, it's great that you guys are willing to help and, you know, help us get grants and this and that. But, uh, you know, we need to get our arms around what the total, total cost is going to be and get a better idea of what grants might be available. I mean, I, I don't see us going ahead with this unless we can get some substantial grants. Agree. <laughs> it it, 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 you would be up against it, you know. Um, uh, I mean, the, the reason to do it, there's many good reasons to do it because, you know, you have a need and, and the village, this village down here can't really grow um, or even maintain itself with the kind of infrastructure it has. but. Um, Roughly, my understanding about what costs would be, and it's, you know, it's a range, uh, depends on how big it would be, all this kind of jazz, is somewhere in the 7 to $12 million range. Um, and my understanding from Craig and others is that uh, there's federal and state money that's available. And generally speaking, what's left for the town to have to pick up is up to about 20%, it might be 10 to 20% of whatever that cost would be for a match. So um, as I think about it, I think, well, that is probably something that we, the galaxy, could come up with. Um, if we were going to have to build our own system, we could just roll that in and come up with that two million or whatever it might be, and that might be the same or slightly less or more than what it would cost us to build our own system. Um, so 
you know, just trying to be who we are can't really help ourselves. It seems like it would be a pity to not make that opportunity available to you guys. And what would the rate be? Um, well, probably in some ways, having gone through this with in, in the, many years ago with Waitsfield a little bit, um, you know, there's a there's a space that it needs to hit in order to be um, uh, bearable by any user. You know, whether it's a commercial user or a residential user. I mean, if, uh, it, it can't be onerous to have town water if you already have water and you're like, well, I'm fine, I'm, I'm good, you know. Um, so whatever that rate is would probably be about whatever market rate would be. But because you wouldn't have, in my fantasy world, which is not a bad one, um, you wouldn't have that 20% debt service because we would erase that. So your debt service would be minimal. The cost of operation would be what it would be, but it would be sort of like for the road crew, if your equipment all got bought mm -hmm. and you didn't have any of that debt service and you just had to operate it, you know? Um, so that's sort of how I'm approaching this. Uh, if that makes any sense to you, Peter, um, because it does it for us, and I, I think, you know, obviously the first step is to get some kind of an idea about how the, yeah. how the people are going to potentially benefit from this feel about it. Um, yeah. I just wanted the other, the other thing that I, I didn't really understand, and I mean, I, I understand it on some level, but I just don't want to confuse people by, by asking all those wastewater questions. Because my understanding was when we went through this the last time that we didn't have a wastewater problem, potentially, what we had was a water supply problem. So I'm just concerned that by bringing up all those wastewater questions, we're going to scare people as well. Um, we're not saying that any of these are questions that you need to ask. You guys know your, your people more than we do. Um, but one of the things that I do think about is that in the village, this is uh, 19th century technology that's in place um, for a lot of the places that are still here as far as water and sewer. You know, it's coming from across the river. Um, you know, the state doesn't really like it. You know, they want to get everybody off of surface water. Um, and it's not, who knows what the pipes are? in some cases. Um, and we also know that pro it's most likely that a lot of the pre-existing uh, residence and architecture that's in place doesn't meet any actual iso today's standards of isolation distance from your well and your house and your septic system or even be a legal septic system. So it, it begins to make sense to begin to think about what that is. And if you take the water off the land, because uh, some people do have drilled wells, Peter, then that makes isolation distances easier to meet for existing residences and other buildings that would need to have um, septic systems that could actually comply and meet their need. Um, at Camp Mead, we have engineered sy uh, systems and all that kind of stuff. They all meet state, you know, we've been through all the state stuff. Um, so we, you know, we know we're good. We know we have good soils. And you have a fair amount of good soils in the village if you want it to be able to have the ability to provide more jobs, et cetera. So um, one of the things I think about, Peter, is if you had a water system which was able to supply hydrants, um, for fire protection, which would also have a, be a bonus to everybody who lives within that district because your insurance rates would go down. Um, it would allow, uh, it would make it economically possible for certain kinds of commercial development to happen, which would provide jobs and housing as well, because sprinkler systems are really expensive if you don't have 
the kind of um, water that we could provide because we have enough head, head height up there. Um, our preliminary designs are around 750 feet or so, and we could go higher if, if needed. Um, uh, and that would provide more than enough head pressure to have a good fire suppression system down here, you know, real hydrants, all that kind of jazz. So then you begin to have some tools which you can say, as townspeople, what do we want for the future? Do we want to have housing be available here? And can we tie that into um, whatever your zoning might be and whatever some kind of linkage might be, which is you can build, oh, well, I'll just be extreme, okay? You can build five $2 million houses and then somebody's got to build five affordable houses or something like that because you can control how your infrastructure is used. It's just like you do a road. You can say, well, this is the rating. This is the road rating and um, you're going to have to get a special permit to have a 72,000 pound truck go over the road or whatever that might be, right? Um, so I think what I'm just trying to do is say there's an opportunity here for you to really think about what you want to do um, for the future as you, as you imagine it, you know? Um, I'm not predicting a future. I'm just here saying we want to do a little development up there that will have a daycare, have some jobs, have some this and that, have some mixed-use housing and have some affordable and unaffordable housing and, most, and keep a fair amount of the land what it is. So we don't know what our total build out is because we're really only thinking about phase one, which we're just about sort of starting to, getting ready to do our per permitting for. And that's in the um, mixed use zone area, um, which is I think only about 40 acres out of the 278 acres. Um, so create a little um, hub in that way. Craig, I think I see you. Um, do you want to, you know, I'm, I'm good at putting my foot in my mouth, um, so if you have an extractor and you want to sort of jump in here at some point, um, that might be uh, a good idea. Let's okay. Um, evening, everybody. Uh, sorry, sorry I'm late. Um, so I, I believe one of the things that Russ has provided is a draft of a village questionnaire that we discussed the last time um, this project uh, came up. And, and so what this is, is a draft document of kind of typical questions we would ask uh, the general public related to their on-site wastewater um, and water supply systems. Um, more so in this case, obviously, water supply, but we do have some community wastewater questions in there, um, kind of mixed in there. And the idea is to try to gain some additional information related to um, need, uh, but also more specifically how, how um, amenable the community might be to a community wastewater or, or excuse me, water supply system. Um, so we provided this as kind of an opportunity for the board to comment if there's questions you want added on here, questions you want removed. Um, we really feel that the biggest one and on town letterhead, uh, so that it is a town exercise. Um, that it is being subsidized by Galaxy of Yes as far as it being distributed and collecting all of that information. So if the town would like that stuff to be sent directly to Otter Creek, we can do it that way. If the town would like to have that stuff sent to them first um, so that they get the initial copy of it, it's really up to you guys um, how we go through the process of doing this, but we wanted to kind of give everybody a starting point with these are what we think are at least the baseline questions that we would like answered uh, from a community perspective. And we wanted to give you guys the opportunity to add or to supplement to that as you saw fit, um, assuming that you do want to distribute this to the, to the potential users. I have a question. Craig, you know what might be helpful 
since you've been through the process of um, helping towns uh, uh, get funding and build water systems and sewer systems, um, but we're just talking about water system, is maybe you could just sort of give a general overview of Here's where we generally find federal money. Here's where we generally find state money. Here's where we find money under a pillow or whatever the hell it is. Um, and here's what a, a local match normally is. And it takes about this amount of time. And what's the process? And what are we looking for? Um, and, and you know, what what would an end point look like? Something like that, so that. These conversations are begin to be in the context of an overall understanding of what it would mean to have a municipal system. Does that make any sense to you guys? Yes. Okay. Um, so, generally, um, whenever we start with conversations about the creation of a water system, uh, the initial question of need. Uh, needs to be addressed, whether that is a need due to failed uh, water supplies, uh, treatment requirements, contamination issues. First, it's demonstrating that there's a need in the community. And then assuming there is a demonstrated need and the community is willing to kind of go down those roads, there's various funding options that are available to a municipality to look at the development of a water system. Um, typically, there are two main routes uh, to supply funding, and that's USDA rural development, and then there's the state's revolving loan fund. Um, both are federally funded programs uh, that are run by USDA or the state in those circumstances. And they have various uh, amounts of planning money that's available um, to further look into the need um, and determine a potential solution to that need. Um, so generally speaking, how this process would normally work, assuming um, the town did want to proceed with this, is you'd have to do a preliminary engineering study, which outlines the need the potential alternatives, and then uh, identifies a potential solution to meet the express need. Um, we've done a similar report for Russ's project. Um, we would need to expand that a little bit based on what the town's needs um, would be, and that would be kind of what they call step one. Um, step one would produce a document that allows you guys to look at alternatives, it also uh, would look at future user costs. So I know you guys had mentioned the report that you guys did, I think in the early 2000s. And what came out of that report was, here's a typical user cost for a water system if you had X amount of users. That's essentially what comes out of that, that step one, that preliminary study. Here's what this would look like. Here's what we think the uh, annual cost would be per user on the water system. Step two, well, let me step back. Step one then gives the town the opportunity to look at that and go, do we like these solutions? Do we like the preferred solution? And do we want to proceed forward with looking at design of that solution, which would be step two? Um, there's federal money available to do that. Uh, part of a loan slash forgivable loan. Um, some programs use grants, some don't, but essentially some mixture of grant and loan related to the design. And then you design the system, get to the end of that, update your cost, update your user cost, and then at that point in time, typically go to a bond vote if the town decided to move into a construction project, which the construction would be step three. So those are the general steps of how that would work. Funding options along the way, our general approach is, is that you leave the door open to as many of those opportunities as you can until you're required to eliminate those options. Um, one of the steps that would kind of be in between step one and step two um, would be what they call an income survey. So I think we talked about this last time. Generally speaking, when we look at mean household income, it's across the entire town. Um, there are circumstances where looking at the income of the actual user base 
gives a more accurate picture of affordability and doesn't skew it by what tends to happen in Vermont towns is that the village is poorer than the out the outlying areas of, of a given town. Um, and those mean household income numbers get skewed as you get further out. So assuming the town wanted to move forward with looking at a design, one of the interim steps would be doing an income survey. Um, there, there is a company, um, REARC, who does income surveys for communities, and they would do a similar, essentially, questionnaire slash survey of what we expect to be the service area for the water system and try to get a more accurate depiction of the mean household income. Um, the lower the mean household income, the better your subsidies, your grants, or your forgivable loans, uh, and that portion of which, what portion of that is loan versus forgivable loan or grant, the lower the mean household income, the higher the grant or the forgivable loan is. So at that point in time, the town would get a, a sense of how much subsidy might be available for them moving from into design and eventually into construction. Again, one of those data points to understand whether this financially makes sense for the town uh, to participate in. Um, it's not a quick process. Uh, it's not necessarily always a straightforward process. Um, there are circumstances where sometimes we take two steps forward and have to take a step backwards, depending on some of the answers that we got in those steps. So it is a back and forth. Um, it's not something that will happen tomorrow if the town decides that they want to go down this road. And I think the town needs to understand that there will be multiple options off ramps related to this. So saying yes to kind of moving this forward doesn't mean you're saying yes to the whole thing. It's you're saying yes to kind of move to the next mile marker um, related to kind of this overall process. So just in general, uh, Russ and Craig, and I and I think we talked about this the, the last time you came in, I have already heard, and I imagine other board members have already heard uh, after our first discussion and the, the minutes, I've heard from quite a number of people in town, probably almost a dozen who have said, we don't think we should have to pay for a water system for the village. What's up, what's up with this? And uh, you know, I think that's something we have to think about whether we're gonna create, and I know I talked about this the last time, a fire district so that the users are the ones who pay whatever the whatever the cost is and whatever the operating cost is. I think we need to be careful when we're sending out these surveys, like if all of a sudden we send out an income survey to the whole town, uh, I think the town's gonna freak out, to put it, to put it bluntly. And uh, I, I just think we need to be careful who gets the survey and who, get, who, who participates in all of this, because we've got to make it clear to the town, assuming it is our intent that anything we do would be would be covered by grants and user fees by the people who get the benefit of the water system. So I just so, want to be careful how we go forward. And, and those are those are great things to keep aware of and you're a hundred percent right on that. So two two data points related to that. So fire district is an option. The town also has the option to just assess costs to the users. So you can, within your own municipal structures, say the users are going to cover 100% of the cost of this and we are not gonna to go to the general tax fund to pay any of this. So you, you do have an intermediate option that doesn't require creating a fire district. The yeah, only so reason I say that is- At the last time, and we need to understand what that is because- right. I, my understanding had been that the way to do that was to create a fire district. So if there's another option, we go ahead with this. We need to look at the other option. But I think, and uh, I'm not trying to speak for the board. I'm speaking for myself. But I think we need to, if we're going to go forward with this, make it clear that our intent, that that is our intent, whether it's creating a fire district or through some other mechanism that the potential users would be paying for the cost. Sure. And I think to the income part of that discussion, the intent would not be an income survey to everybody in the town. What it would be is an income survey to that user base. So the specific people we think would be able to connect, not everybody in town. So I think that even furthers kind of what you're trying to say is we're 
only looking at the people who might connect and what their mean their income is associated with that. I think also too with the questionnaire that should be limited to the potential service area that we've kind of identified, give or take maybe a few people here or there. I don't think you want to send this out town wide because people who are way outside the village, that's erroneous information that doesn't even really help us in this process anyway. So we can give you the parcel information for the people we think would be part of the service area. And I, I recommend that that's who we go out with this questionnaire to is those specific, specific landowners who we think would be users of the system, not everybody in town, especially the people who we know are going to be users on the system. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Right. We've got a question from Dorinda, and then Sarah also right. has uh, some comments or questions. Yeah, my question, mine goes beyond the initial establishing, you know, getting the grants to put this all in, but then you've got the who's going to maintain, who's going to build these people, who's, you know, um, you still got all the taxpayers paying the bookkeeper, the treasurer, whoever it is, paying their salaries. You're not going to be able to delineate, you know, that portion just to the users on the system. So it's going to be an impact to all taxpayers. Um, once it's established and going forward. What happens if there's a problem with the system? Is the 35, I think I counted 35 parcels in the village district, those 35 parcels are going to be able to pick up all this cost? I think it goes beyond getting all the grants and everything to get it in. There is the operational side of it that's going to go on forever. And before so you... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, you're 100% you're right, and part of that study, that step one that we were talking about, includes all the operational and ongoing maintenance costs related to that. So that is included in the quote-unquote cost of all of that is the administrative side of that, the ongoing maintenance related to that. So all of that will be included in that and then would be broken down per user cost. So essentially you account for what that cost is and then you include that in the user cost on top of the actual quote unquote construction cost. So it is incorporated into that, um, but it's, it's separated out in the report so you know capital improvements versus ongoing administrative and, uh, and operation and maintenance costs. And Craig, am I right? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Go that ahead. automatically falls to the town accounting department, it sounds like. No. No. It stays within, it would, it, we'll use the highway department. Say the highway department was like its own thing and it was bought and paid for by somebody else and it was, um, no, it's not really a good analogy because everybody drives on the town. Right. <laughs> but um, the water system in Waitsfield, for example, has no impact to the property tax rate because the rate for the water usage includes all of the billing, all of the maintenance, all of the testing that needs to be done um, by the state every you know month, year, all of that kind of stuff. So it doesn't fall, it, it needs to, it has to support itself. It doesn't fall to the town at all. Right, but who does use, so there's going to be somebody sitting in an office somewhere that's going to be doing all this, is what you're saying. And it will be paid for by the users. Right, so it's not any part of the municipal government. What's the um, difference between what you're saying and a water district? Um, middle sex with water district. Yeah, you can define the district, Craig, you can jump in where you want. Um, within mm -hmm. your municipality, a fire district was more popular years ago when, uh, say, in the Mad River Valley, we, we would looked at doing um, some sewage treatment that would uh, serve more than one town, or a water system that would serve more than one town, hydrants in more than one town. Then you need to create um, a fire district so that you can do that. But in Middlesex, uh, I mean, you can stay on this side of the Winooski and um, make it as big as you want as demand grows, right? So that you could say the district is going to be from 
somewhere down Route 2 to somewhere to where it crosses the Winooski to up above, you know, up to the Notch Road or wherever it would be, and, and uh, a main will run to there. And if somebody wants to go again at some point in the time, in the future, those things would have to be figured into what the cost of the water business would be um, so that it wasn't throwing a burden on the rest of the taxpayers. I'll drift off just for a little bit and say if your downtown becomes more vibrant, whatever that is, sort of like what we're trying to do, it is a benefit to everybody to have um, you know, a better, a better downtown. If we had water, like the railroad buildings, they don't have any water and they don't have any way to get rid of water if they had it. But those buildings could grow up and become something if they had um, some water available to them and they had some way to deal with that in, in some way by taking away other, um, not taking away, by being able to eliminate other wells that really are probably not up to snuff um, because we know PFAS and all this stuff is everywhere now. And once you start to test the water, you're going to find um, that there's probably pretty serious um, problems almost everywhere. Sarah, you had something? Um, the, there, at the last meeting when uh, uh, these guys were here, there was a discussion, a big discussion about what this water district might like, what this service area might look like. So I did a really, I'm not an engineer, I just did a really rough sketch. And mm -hmm. here's some of this using our tax map identifying sure. parcels. And I think this is where Dorinda Kim got the idea of 35 mm -hmm. um, parcels, mm -hmm. just in case anybody want to look at it. Peter, you don't have it. I think I said two, Bridget. And does that okay. seem, does, if, you're, if, you're, if you're talking about setting the survey just to the service area versus the town in general, is this, what you're, is this the area that you're looking at pretty much? Um, not having that in front of me, I could compare with what we identified in the service area. I've got a map. I can compare that with your map. But yeah, generally speaking, I think 35 parcels sounds generally right. right. Maybe a little bit more here or there. Um, just to go back to the fire district thing just for, just for a second. So to add to that conversation, the fire districts were created back in the 80s to give private landowners access to federal dollars by calling them a pseudo municipality and that's that's really why the fire districts were created was you had a bunch of people usually in a neighborhood district or you had 30 or 40 people who wanted a community water system the town wasn't in support of it they create a fire district that fire district is a pseudo municipality that allows them access to those federal dollars the issue becomes there's a water board or a, a, a board that's created on that that relies on that board not aging out. And so that they have new people coming in, they have new people connected to the water system who are now going to do the next 20, 30 years of what needs to be done on the water system. And what we're seeing with a lot of the fire districts that were created in the 80s, they can't get people to fill seats. They can't, they don't have functioning boards. Um, and a lot of them are going back to some of the municipalities and going, please take these over because we don't have anybody to continue this moving forward. So th there are definitely pros and cons to both approaches. I don't think you guys should eliminate either one of those There's options because there are pros and cons to both. And depending on the village's situation, there may be one that's more applicable and more beneficial than others. And I think you leave both of those options open uh, as long as you can related to that. I think the, I think the important thing, excuse me, Brandy, I, I think the important thing that we need to consider is that our principle is going to be that if we go ahead with this project, it's going to be designed in such a way that all the costs, Dorinda, are going to be covered by the group of people who, who get the service. Now, whether that turns out to make it economically unfeasible to do this, <coughs> excuse me, it may do that, mm -hmm. but I don't see us going ahead if that isn't the case. So I'm ready to go ahead with the survey and start the process. I'm certainly not saying that we know the answer of whether this is all going to work or not. <laughs> excuse me. Right. I have a question for you, Craig. Um, one of the things I 
I'm assuming, but you know, you never should assume, is that uh, Galaxy, we know we have to spend money to have a, a water system. And we can uh, probably fund some of these things, which normally might be a um, forgivable loan, you know, that you'd have to apply for. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I wonder, is, would that then be something that we could contribute, we the Galaxy, to the effort as um, sort of in-kind match money that the town would have gotten by, by having us do some of that work? Um, so the, the short answer to that is yes. Um, the longer answer is right now the town is looking to go get a planning loan to mm -hmm. do the preliminary engineering study, the step one. Um, I've seen turnaround times on those loan applications somewhere in the five to six month range, if not longer. So from a timing standpoint, there would be some benefit to being able to move that forward. And if Galaxy wanted to essentially fund a preliminary engineering study right. for the town's benefit, um, that's certainly an op option that's available uh, and would speed the process up as opposed to um, using federal dollars or some of this planning loan money uh, in order to pay for the study itself. So that's certainly an option that's available to you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't restrict the town in any way as far as the document, how the document gets used. Um, so I don't see a downside for that if that was something that you were willing to consider. Yeah, we would be willing to do that because, uh, you know, we're, we're going to want to use water at some point and then not way long distant time. So anything that we can do to sort of help us all to move forward without um, going forward and backwards in some way would make sense. And so we're willing to gamble, I guess, is, is what I'd say, you know. So uh, just to, to be conscious of time, yeah. uh, I just want to open it up to any of the other board members to, if there's anything that hasn't been touched on, we've got about five minutes before we move on. Um, Bridget, did you have anything? We haven't heard a whole lot from you, but you're good. Okay. Sarah has Sarah. something. So Sarah. My only concern is that if you send out a survey on, on town letterhead, I really think that there needs to be an explanatory paragraph of all the things we've said here, which is that the Galaxy of Yes has water on its property. Right. This is the beginning. I don't think that anybody should be under the illusion that suddenly the town of Middlesex has come on a water supply. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, OK. I, I think that's a recommendation, a quick little uh, cover letter to go along with the questionnaire as to why these particular people are receiving that and under what circumstances they are and what the town is considering. I think all of that co context is great and will save you guys phone calls and getting stopped at the store and everything else related to that as well. Are, are we looking for a, a, a decision on this? survey as to who to send it to and and how it's prepared or are we are we looking at that at, at a future date bridget randy i did have one question um peter had mentioned previously concerns on a good portion of the questions currently in the questionnaire um yeah. peter how do you feel about that now that was to do with the uh I, 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 we need to we need to look over that questionnaire and, and decide which questions we really want to ask. I mean, the, the, the real question for me is to be able to say to these people, we have an opportunity based on the fact that there is excess capacity uh, available for water for the village. If we were to do this, the cost would be borne by the users of the water. And this is our estimate of what the potential cost might be if this all came to pass would you be interested in being connected and beyond that the rest of the questions to me i i just, I just don't think we want i think we want to make it one page that's simple to respond to and just take take the temperature of everybody and see where they are there's plenty of time to ask more questions later so that's the way i feel about it i would agree with that and then um uh, randy again following up um 
So I would say, what is what is the galaxy's position on us revamping that that the survey? Uh, our position is we brought it in here so you could. <laughs> um, we're, we're just, I'm just working with Craig, and uh, you can work also directly with Craig. Um, uh, to we wanted to give you a start point and, and, yeah. a, and a basis to get going, but you're 100% right. This is coming from you guys. This should be what you want on there and what you don't want on there specifically. So you're not going to hurt Russ's feelings and you're not going to hurt my feelings by adding, subtracting, starting over entirely with what you guys want to do. We just wanted to give you something as kind of a starting point and say, here's a typical um, sort of set of questions. What do you guys want on there? Because it really does need to come from the town to the users. And if it just comes from me or if it just comes from Russ, it's probably going to read that way as well. And that's certainly not and then um, not one what more we're question. To do. So I would certainly encourage the board to go through that. So Randy, maybe um, it, with regard to making a decision tonight, it's who would be the person to make those edits? I, I would suggest that we all make a suggestion uh, for edits, um, you know, like, and do it as a collaborative group and then present something at a later point in time for their review again, um, maybe we can commit to doing that for our next meeting, which is right around the holiday. So there's going to be some discussion on when that meeting happens too. But our next meeting uh, is the 20th of June. Oh, the 20th. Okay, I was already thinking of July 4th. <laughs> Sorry, my brain's somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I think I think collectively uh, as a group, just you know, proposing different edits or thoughts that people have. It's is what I would support. That sounds good to me too. And I'd say you, you guys can work directly with Craig. He's smarter than I am about all this stuff. And I'll just add one thing, and we would end up just being a user. You know, so right. we're gonna wanna have it as cheap as possible too. <laughs> so can I just ask the last at your last meeting when you discussed this, you also discussed whether or not to send this just to the to the service group. And also to whether or not to save, send it to the whole town. And I don't think you, I heard a decision tonight in minutes about that. It sounded like tonight we were we were just really leaning towards supporting just sending it to the service group. All right. Is that the consensus of this group? Yeah. At least initially. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. And, and let me just add in, if you guys do have any questions or want to send me anything, feel free um, to do so. I'm happy to help however it makes sense for you guys. Craig, could you be available at the next meeting to help us while we make the ed those edits? Uh, as long as somebody can send it to me uh, tomorrow or the day after before my week, my uh, month fills up. But as of right now, that date is open, so I should be able to make that work. Okay, cool. I'm, a, I'm assuming we have Craig's okay, contact and phone. Thing, and I, need, I know we need to move ahead with our agenda, Randy, but... Um, if this if this goes forward and we get any kind of a positive response from the community, we should probably have a meeting and have Craig come to the meeting and let people ask because people are going to have questions. Mm -hmm. And I yep. just think that this is going to be if this is going to work, it has to be a consensus building process because there are going to be a lot of doubters, especially when they hear that we're sure. Yep, no, happy to participate. Dollars or whatever the. <laughs> whatever the huge number is to do this. So anyway. Yeah, no, and happy to participate in any public forum that you guys think would be helpful to kind of f uh, facilitate this conversation further if that's the way you choose to go. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Russ. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next item on tonight's agenda, uh, final review of the town's personnel policy. Action possible. Randy, do you know um, where in the where we, we left last? Off. Well, uh, uh, we left off at the end of sick, sick time, right? Yeah, yeah. you connected personal leave. Yes. So section 23, Bridget. 
personal leave. Thank you. Um, I guess I can read through the section. Just um, it says those employed full time by the town on January first will on that day receive three days of paid personal leave per year. Anyone hired for a full-time position after January 1st will receive three days of paid personal leave the following January 1st, provided said employee is still employed full-time by the town. Pay for personal leave will be used at the employee's regular rate of pay. Um, if an employee does not use all of the employee's personal leave in a year, the employee may not carry those unused leave forward to the next year upon separation from employment. An employee will not be compensated for unused personal leave. I personally don't see any reason to revise that. I think it's fine. I just haven't, uh, there's just a typo on the third sentence uh, when it says three days. I just see an extra space there. Yes. So I have a question. So if you get hired on the 15th of January, you don't get any personal leave time until the following year. Correct. Does it make sense to say, you know, if you're fired and hired in the first half of the year, you get one and a half days, or I don't want to make it complicated. I don't want to try and prorate it down to the day. But it seems a little rough to me to say, if you get hired after the second day of January, you don't get any personal leave for a whole year. Whereas if you were hired the week before, you would have gotten three days. Just a thought. Would you just split it at the six month mark? Yeah, for some, or if we could do it quarterly, whatever you think. but. Three days doesn't divide very well quarterly. Just to make it simple, I'd say if, if you're hired the first six months of the year, you get a day and a half personal leave for that year. Uh, and if you get hired in the second half, maybe you get three quarters of one day or something, just so you get a little personal leave. So do you, are you saying that we hand out the personal time? Because the reason I think you guys put it in there when you did it is they had three days at the beginning of the year. So the people who are here on January 1, are we going to hand it out in quarters or halves or whatever you decide to do? Or is it the people on January 1 get the three days and then if it, you do six months, that person gets a day and a half? Or are you uh, going to hand uh, it? And that, we, that they get the three days at the beginning of the year the same way we do it now. Okay. But just just <clears throat> change the language so that somebody who gets hired after January 1st gets a little bit of whatever the whatever we decide, it's a little bit of personal fun. But not make it complicated and confusing, whatever we do. Yeah, fiscal year. yeah so why not, why not just break it up into three four month periods and for depending on which period they're hired in, they would get those days. Yeah, I agree. Can I make a suggestion to put it in hours as opposed to days? So like yes. the January one would be 24 hours, the June one or July one would be 12 hours. That could get confusing when it comes to summertime hours. Yes, yeah. yes. Right. Let's so, change it to, to uh, 24 right. hours instead of three days and then break the year up into three three different periods and depending on when they're hired, they would essentially be prorated into that, so into if those some, buckets. So if somebody was hired on January 15th, they wouldn't start until March is what you're saying. Yeah, it's kind of what I... It's either that or you go to a full prorated schedule where whatever portion of the year is, you prorate the hours by that. And I, I mean, I would be fine with that too. I think that's, I think that's more straightforward. Um, calculation on their hire date, and then they're, they're provided those. And I would assume that personal leave would be accessible after any probationary period. That's the other thing that this doesn't cover that I would assume we would want to make it 
You mean the probationary period? What's that? You mean the probationary period? Yes. Yeah. You don't have one in their personnel no. policy. No, I was say there's no. There's no. You okay. guys took it out. <laughs> okay. So I mean, but essentially what you're saying is you. If you don't have something stipulating that, somebody could start on January 15th, you could give them their time, and they could use it all that week and get done the following week. Yeah. So <laughs> I think there needs to be real parameters around this. Yeah, I mean, it's right now there's none. It's If you're working on January 1st, you get the three days or the 24 hours, and the, you wait for the next January 1st to get more, no matter when you were hired. Um, that sounds simpler. Maybe not more <laughs> fair, but it's pretty cut and dried. Pretty cut and dried. <laughs> I like cut and dried. Can I make a suggestion? Sure, go ahead. Why can't you get eight hours that first year, I mean, eight hours every four months? Work four months, get eight hours. Work four months, get eight hours. Work four months, get eight hours. Then you're done. Because you went from 24 hours to 32. Did I? Tw eight, eight, eight. You said, you said. The first four months you get eight hours. Oh, four months yeah. as opposed to three? Yeah. The second um, four months you get another eight hours. The third four, four months you get another eight hours. So the, the only problem that I see with that is, is somebody's ability to use that time in a timely manner and it not going away um, at the end. But... That was why you guys gave it on January 1, because we were doing it like when they got hired, but then they couldn't use it by December 31st. Right. That's exactly what happened. Right. <laughs> and the other thing you do is just leave it along the way it is. <laughs> I, like I think that was I, Victor's suggestion. <laughs> We've got about four different kinds of leave here, or maybe more than that, that we're going to be considering in the next few minutes. So there's plenty of opportunities for leave. I'm supportive of leaving it as it sits. So I'm going to do it. Randy, maybe you could throw in a, a qualifier statement and, and um, where to, at Eric's discretion or something. No, I think no. if if it's going to be anything, yeah. it would be something that, I mean, for me, it's, if I'm being hired and I'm reading this personnel policy ahead of time and I have an issue with it, I'm bringing it to the table as a negotiation mm -hmm. um, and, and let it be at that. Okay. I'm fine with that. I would go forward and change it to 24 yes. hours as opposed okay. to days. I agree with that, Dorinda. Is there a consensus on that? I'm good with it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading for 24 hours previous to that. You just did the conversion. You just added it. That's all. Uh, moving on, Section 24, uh, parental and family leave. Uh, do folks feel like I need to read it out loud? No. Okay, thank no. you. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's I think it's fine the way it is. We follow the law. That's basically what that says. So. This is where I'm going to raise it. We Sarah? have had a request in the past that you've dealt with by saying it's not our personnel policy, and that is for bereavement death leave. Do you want to put this here? Do you want to address it? Do you want to move on? I'm just bringing things from the past. So to you. Um, I would say we'll, we'll deal with it at another point. Don't <laughs> let's not muddle it with this. Okay. Um, section 25, short-term family leave. Those are all federal. Yeah, guidelines. I mean, it's, there's nothing. I think that's, I think that's fine, too. The, the only I'm thing that, the only thing that comes to mind here was, was there an issue with that we were facing uh, as far as like qualifying people within um, one piece of our policy last year? Was there something that we had to deal with? What cons? That was on a hiring process, I think. Okay, so what it had nothing to do with any of these, now. okay. No. 
Um, so we're all we're all in support of just leaving Section 25 alone. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am. Section 26, leave of absence without pay. I'm fine with the way that sits. Yeah, I'm fine too. Um, so I guess, you know, moving on from uh, absence, uh, bereavement leaves that Sarah brought up. Um, right now there's nothing in the policy. Um, does the board support exploring uh, the addition I, of, of bereavement? I, I, am, I support allowing time for bereavement, but I don't think it should be a special heading. In other words, if you have a, a family member pass away, it, you know, I think the employee should be allowed to take time off. Whether he takes it at, I mean, whether he takes it at uh, vacation or or uh, sick leave. I mean, uh, I think sick leave is, is should be allowed for that. But um, yeah, otherwise, you're going to be giving him another time out, right? Another three or four days off. Yes, that's the conversation. I think the when we discussed this before, I think what we decided was that they could use any accumulated vacation time we had and at discretion of the supervisor, we would allow them to take time even if, in other words, in other words, go in the hole on vacation time in a reasonable way if they had no vacation time. That would be at the you know, the discretion of the supervisor, if it was the road crew, or I guess the select board, if it was somebody else. But I agree, people should be able to take time off. I don't want somebody, somebody's in a bereavement situation and they've just used up their vacation. I don't want to tell them they have to take it without pay. But I, I don't think that needs to be in there. I think we can just agree that that's the way it's going to be. We allow them to go negative. If we, if we remember, remember. I'll remember. I'll remember. Okay. That's, that's, it. It. that's it. That's if we're all it. here. <laughs> well, we can put we can put that language. We can put a sentence in there that says, if a situation arises where there's no vacation time available, a reasonable amount of uh, time will be allowed, and the person will go in the hole or whatever the right language is on their vacation time. That makes everybody more comfortable. I just think we have to be able to let people do it, and I don't think we should be telling them they have to do it without pay. Absolutely. Under what section should that go? Well, if it's if it's going to be tied to the vacation leave, then it should be it should be entered in underneath the vacation leave. Well, vacation or sick, you're uh, saying, right. or personal. Or personal. I, well, I mean, so personal, you know, personal is, and, and so my thoughts on personal leave is, hey, I need a personal day. It's not approved time off. Uh, vacation leave is, is approved time off. Um, so maybe that's. Bereavement shouldn't be approved. So that's off. so maybe it needs to fall under the personal leave and allow allowing them to go in the hole on personal leave, because I, I do struggle with that. You know, if it's I shouldn't have to get permission to go, you know, deal with a death in my family. Um, and if you're going to let me go in the hole, let me go in the hole on time that technically I don't need approval on. So let it fall under the personal leave and not vacation. But they don't earn personal leave for another year. I know. So, so we're taking a risk. At, 
I think you that, could create an, your own section that says that you know you are, can use you know any time you have available or something like that. If you have no time available, then go to what Peter says. We with you know we will allow you to. Because technically, it, it's all approved time off. Right. Uh, I mean, you could deny you could de you could deny a vacation request. No, I can deny anybody if I if I need the people. We never had anything in any personnel policy that I had to be administering that allowed people to go in the hall. That was done on an informal basis, on an as-needed basis, and we certainly over the years, and Noel Johnson did it four or five different times for different reasons. We allowed people with a cancer diagnosis to go in the hole on their sick time, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, I don't think it necessarily needs to be in the personnel policy. Sarah has I, Just to refresh your memory, we had a road foreman who came here, we had a prior road foreman who wanted to, it was a, we have a, you had a whole meeting about this, who was upset that he was not being compensated for going to his wife's sister's funeral, mother-in-law's funeral or whatever. It wasn't a direct relative, but it was an issue. I can dig up those minutes if you need a refresher. That was from two years ago, maybe. Yes. No, I remember. Oh, maybe a year ago. I don't know. But, but that's I think why you're addressing this now. I think that's where your definition of what a uh, immediate family member is, you know? And I think you had decided at one point that you went by the federal guidelines of what is considered an immediate family member, and his wife's sister fell out of that definition, if I recall. Right. That was the issue. But didn't, in that case, didn't the individual want extra time? No, I think they just wanted paid time off. Right, which is... Separate from their vacation time. Isn't that extra time? Yes, I guess you're right. right. I mean, yeah, if you... Yeah, yeah. they didn't want it. They didn't want it. To, I'm not I don't want to use my time because I want to go deer hunting. Right. Yes, that was it. But I'm really bereaving a lot. <laughs> um, I found the minutes. I mean, in my... Time, I can never remember having an other problem with bereavement time other than that one situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe that's the reason just to leave it alone. Um. Well, we didn't grant, you didn't grant him that time, extra time. Is that correct? I don't believe we did. It's like COVID. They but you gave him the option that you were going to pay paid time off COVID. if he wanted to. Um, okay. So, um, I don't know how you found that spot either, but. So, uh, Dorinda says the town doesn't have a policy for bereavement pay that the personnel policy does allow for personal days. There's an employee who wants to use bereavement and interpreted a section of the personnel policy to say that was allowed. In reviewing this issue, Dorinda came across a clerical error, blah, 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 we to shoot that. Um, to that issue aside, Dorinda asked how the bereavement question should be addressed since the personnel policy does not cover bereavement leave. Peter said the employee should use either personal time or vacation time. Peter said he doesn't want to create a bereavement leave policy if the policy doesn't happen. Vic noted that paychecks outline exactly how much sick, personal, and vacation time exists so the employee should know exactly what his options were. That's what we decided. And that was from September 2021. I still feel the same way. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I just don't think it's, it isn't, it isn't like we've had a recurring problem with this. I think we should just leave it alone. Okay. I mean, it doesn't. No, okay, no. If somebody asks, it's we have no policy on it, so you use your time available. Right. right. And that's the way. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, where was it? Military leave? Military leave. That's pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. Yep. Jury. 
Jury leave, section 28. Again, it feels pretty straightforward to me. I don't suggest any change. Section 29, overtime. <laughs> we follow the rule. So, should I move the microphone over? <laughs> I do have uh, a thought that we might want to consider. Um, last time we met, we talked about vacation time and making sure people took their vacation time. If we pay out overtime anything outside of our normal work hours and we cover our 40 hours with either physically working, a sick day, or a vacation day, I think you should still pay, pay out overtime, as long as it's available to you, as in not going in the hole. Can you clarify that? For the we don't have an overtime hole. No. The available time off without going in the hole. So like vacation time, if you're in the hole, you can't do that, or sick time. It'd be available time that you've already accrued. Right, but they're not working those hours, so that would essentially be buying out their paid time off. I don't understand how that works. It's already time that they've already been given. It's and, it, and whatever, it, it's not allowing them to take that vacation time later on in the year, so it's helping use up vacation time. See, what, what we run into is we're expected to be available 24 seven, which is fine. I understand that, that's the job, but there's no compensation for that. So if you work a Saturday and a Sunday plowing snow, and then you're sick on Thursday, you just lost a day's overtime. Well, but overtime isn't, for me, that's part of the job and overtime isn't, isn't it's not guaranteed, it's not a right. Um, it's, and this is exactly why I brought up the, the buyout option, because that's, exa that's essentially what's happening here. Um, I, I don't understand that part, but, but okay. If you fine. clarify this for me, what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about overtime? Correct. Or are we talking about the incident with one no, of our... No, I'm talking about overtime, being paid out, anything outside of your normal work hours. Outside of your normal hours. If you're on 10 hours and you work at the four tens and you work... 12, you get paid two hours overtime. If, the, if, if you're on eight hours, five days a week, you work 10 hours, you get two hours overtime. Correct. If you work a weekend and you take all week off, you get paid overtime for the two days on the weekend. Correct. But you also lost a week's vacation that you cannot make up. Correct. That's absolutely right. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. There is for me. I think when we make the decision to not buy out the time. They're not buying out time. You are. You are. Well, you, you absolutely are, and it's so, unbudgeted at that point. So well, when we do no, the budget, let, sure yes, it is. It is. No, so it isn't. It is not. Hours are, 40 hours a week is calculated at, you, you calculate 2,080 hours a year okay. of straight time. Right. So what happens is if you pay a full week's worth of pay, for your sick time, and this in your 2,080 hours includes your sick, sick time, time right? and your vacation yeah. time. So Wouldn't if that you be pay out times that, 40? huh? And that'd be 52 times 40. 52, yeah, isn't it 2,000 and something 280 hours? 280 hours. 2,080 80 hours, right? isn't that what I said? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's your basic pay. Mm -hmm. Then, so then if you paid overtime on that, Okay, so you're still paying your vacation, and you're still paying your sick time. Now you're throwing in overtime for the two days that they worked an extra four hours. That is unbudgeted time, because you've already paid the, you but don't know, you, if they have Don't you budget for 225 hours? Right. But it's, that is over and above the straight time pay. Right. So the first exactly. thing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Exactly, and I don't right. see where you call it buying out overtime. I don't, it, it, if a person works, uh, if a person works 
over, you know, he should be compensated a higher rate if he works over eight hours or 10 hours. If he wants to go four tens, he should be compensated for that. If you work all, if you work Saturday and Sunday, you should be compensated for that. It's not doesn't budget out that way, but Sarah. Okay, so I'm not taking a side on this one way or another. I am just simply giving you the information as a select board assistant. Your your personnel policy says in accordance with the Fair Labor Standards Act, and this is fair. The Fair Labor Standards Act do not require employers to give their employees time off for holidays, vacations, or sick leave, either with or without pay. If your employer allows you to take time off for a holiday a vacation or because you are sick, the time off, even though you are paid for the time, is not hours worked and need not be included in the total hours worked for overtime purposes. Mm -hmm. That's right. So there is no federal law that would require employees to treat hours worked on a holiday as double time. The time worked on a holiday is hours worked just as any other week. But then anyway, I can also send you guys some links to this. That's but it, how it's that, calculated. That's, right. That is, if you are going to stick with that in your policy, that is what the policy says, the Fair Labor Standards Act. I personally disagree with it, but that's okay. I think I, I think that if you work a, if you're working all week and you work on the weekends and then you get sick, that sucks and you should get your overtime. But that's not what the Fair Labor Standards Act says. Okay. Thank you. So where does that leave us? Point the devil in the deep blue state. <laughs> That's, what I'd like to say. That's what we do for all our employees. Um, I mean, if if the if there's a holiday, you just don't get the overtime, and generally they know that, so that they're they're less apt to to work those hours. Well, in the hall, I guess the job situation is so different because um, it's a it's a they don't really have a choice, so. Where don't they have a choice? Well, if it's working over. As a, as a road, that you, if there's a situation that needs attention. Oh, you're talking about us? You're talking about the road uh, crew? I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about the road crew. Okay, yeah, right. They don't have yeah. a choice. Unless you want them, you know, what, we'll wait till Monday and plow the roads if it starts snowing Saturday. So I think the uh, best, only difference that would, that would push me toward the more generous because they don't really they can't pull back on their hours voluntarily so that's the only reason i would probably side with um that it should if you're working that you look at it as the day and that um which is what we do with our guys um on occasion if they if, if they've performed above and beyond um that we have discretion to do that. So I kind of, I'd, I guess I'd side with Sarah. I didn't say that. Well, I know, I, I guess I, I'd side, you said you didn't agree with it, I'm sorry. Oh, oh I didn't agree with the, the late, those labor standards. I see what you're saying, yeah. But I'm not anybody. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if we move on this, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd advocate to move to a structured work day. What's that mean? Five days a week, seven to three, there's your eight hour day. You know if there's overtime coming outside of a, of, of a specific time frame. I, 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 the whole flip flop of hours and what's a working day and, and when do they get, uh, paid overtime versus when they don't. It's it's. I think I think Eric had, uh, addressed that when he said normal working hours. Which is. Well, when you're working four ten-hour days, it's a ten-hour day. When you're working five eight, it's an eight-hour day. But then somebody comes in on a Friday to go grade or something like that, and they're working their four ten-hour days. It's outside of the work, the work week, and all of a sudden they're getting overtime anyway. They will. Not if you're not if you're not over forty hours. Not if sure. The way it's defined outside unless, of the unless work. Unless I were to take a Monday off, 
the way that it's defined the way that it's defined based on the normal working hours if your normal working hours are monday through as thursday as long as your 40 hours are met via physically working or taking approved time off or a holiday right. your 40 hours still have to be met well, not if you take a day off during one of those one of those other days. You got to take it off somehow. You got to account for it. You have to, you have to account for it. Whether it's a vacation day, I'm not saying take the day off without pay, and then get overtime for another day. That doesn't even make sense. Dick. Theoretically, in that policy, that could happen. But even if they took the even if they took a Monday off and then worked a Friday, the the day itself, whether it's sick day or personal or vacation day or whatever but it's still it's still, it's still overtime well that whole thing of uh, 40 hours like we have it right now is crazy uh, if you if you work 40 hours and you take thursday off there's no accountability of where you were thursday you just no yeah, don't worry about it and that just yeah. causes a lot of hate and dissent they in could the have a situation where they put the hours in and don't get paid for it at all. You know how many people are in that boat? What the, now what are you saying? You're talking about you're talking about making sure that they're compensated for that time and and it's just, you know, look at how many salaried employees are out there working a 14-hour well, yeah, day or 12-hour day. Compared salary employees. Why to, not? You, you, Cuz you don't you know, salary salary employee is can you know, uh, you can't turn around and say they're going to get paid. Oh, wow! They work so many hours, and now we're going to pay them overtime. The salary, they salary. They don't get compensated for it. Period. They get compensated by a higher wage. They get compensated for it by a higher wage and better benefits. I don't necessarily agree with that. But. I, hey I guys, just I don't I, I just, I'm going to say that I'm going to say this once and then I'm going to close my mouth. The way I look at this is over 40 hours times worked doesn't count vacation time doesn't count sick time doesn't count personal time you get overtime and that's it simple and I understand the issue of somebody works a 10 hour day when their regular work day is eight hours and they want to get paid for two hours overtime well. If they work the rest of the rest of the week and they put in their eight hours, they will get their two hours overtime. Because otherwise, you're you're buying out you're buying out vacation time. I agree. And maybe we can't agree on this, and we need to defer further discussion on it. But we have beat this beat this horse to death, and obviously, we're not in agreement. So I would suggest we move on from move on from this tonight. And if that means we've got to come back to the personnel policy again and talk about vacation time again, I guess I'm willing to do it, but I'm not going to change my mind. I think we've given very generous pay raises. I think we take good care of our employees. I think they have a lot of opportunities to have time off and unpaid time and everything else. And yes. Part of the road crew job is that you get called in on the weekends to plow snow, and they know that when they pick the job. Peter, I would I would agree that to move forward, I don't think we need to revisit. Can I add one point? And that one point is, Peter, if what happens is they do work a lot of overtime in the winter, and they are hesitant to take time off because they're going to lose it. I think Eric has said, I'm not going to take any time off unless I absolutely have to. So what that does is create a time in the summer, and they have all their time, so they take more time off during the summer, so your, your summer maintenance uh, is neglected. But my, my counter-argument to that is, most of the summer maintenance, I'm not saying we don't have damage from storms and things that need to take care of, but it isn't like a nice storm in the wintertime when we need all hands on deck. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Peter, if the roads get real bumpy and there's a lot of screaming at, at uh, the, the road crew because uh, we're not out there grading. I mean, you can remember a couple of years ago or three or four times in the last 10 years where we didn't do grading, 
because we were doing something else or we didn't have anybody to do it and there was a lot of screaming about the roads. I mean, I, I just think that it, the summer maintenance is very, very, very important. I think Eric has worked real hard at it and I think your road is even uh, quite a lot better than it usually is. <laughs> and I appreciate it. I what? But okay, that's all. I just want to bring up that one point, and you. And I just feel like, I just feel like, especially in the last couple of years, we have done a lot for the road crew, and I know they always want more, whether it's boots or socks or you know whatever it is, they always want more, and we just got to watch the town's bottom line. It's an unbudgeted expense. Um, I think we do a good job of managing it. I don't think people get denied vacation when they ask for it in an unreasonable way. And I, I, I just don't I, like the I, idea of I'm buying a vacation and that's to me what it is. But anyway, that's, that's my opinion. I'm not trying to speak for the board or change anybody else's mind, but I think clearly we're not in agreement. I mean, if we need to, if we need to take a vote and vote up and down about whether we do this, let's take a vote and see what happens. But uh, I'm not ready to change our current policy. That's what I'm saying. For me, I think it's fair. And if the Fair Labor Standards get get changed, then we'll follow. Them. Eric's got something to say. I just, I would like to see how it would cost the town extra money. Maybe we could sit down and you can show me because I, I don't see it. Yeah, I don't. Sure. I, I, was ser I mean, that's a serious, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck about it at all. I really, I don't understand it. Shall well, you? I think, I think the way to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, just dealing with, in the defense world with the union and everything, I could see what may happen is if someone is sick and they can't help it or for whatever reason, they're not going to want to work overtime, whether we need them or not. You almost couldn't blame them. I, I seen it in the, the 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 other world in the in the shop, and if they didn't get paid for the time off for the overtime, they just wouldn't work and wouldn't miss sales. I mean, that's just looking at the other side of it, you right. know. And, and we've heard that. Yeah. We've heard that in the past. And and, and the, the whole other. hourly thing—that's what's beneficial. I mean, I made six figures hourly, so they made me salary, gave me a six thousand dollar raise, and I work twenty four hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of the time I worked there. So I know how that works too, you know? So it's like. The only way you can force anybody to work when there's a snowstorm if they don't want to yeah. is fire them. Yeah. Peter, really, if the guy keeps saying, well, I'm not gonna work, I'm not gonna work. You're only, you're, and, and, and how, how, how often do you want to start firing a bunch of uh, the road crew? That's what we should be doing. If they decline to work, then they should be fired. They're crazy. Listen, I think you think you're talking. I mean, I understand the road the road crew would like this, but I think you're really talking about a problem which which doesn't exist. We pay we pay substantial overtime to the road crew. They expect that overtime. They need it. They want it, and they earn it. And I I don't disagree with any of that. But if all of a sudden you say you can get paid overtime when you're taking when you're taking vacation time or a sick day, I just I just disagree with it. So I would I would recommend that we we pass over consideration of this tonight, and I think maybe just maybe we could finish up the personnel policy other than this issue in about five minutes. I don't think there's much else to talk about, and then we, now we can take this up take this up again at another time. Might I suggest? Might I suggest moving the entire, the rest of the policy too? Um, you know, we're looking at 10 after seven here. Um, we're running 25 minutes off schedule. So instead of moving through the rest of the report, uh, the rest of the policy, move the uh, entire conversation and finish it up in the next meeting. That's, that's fine, yep. What's one more meeting? Um, Treasurer's well, report. I want, to, I want to ask one, just one other question uh, for Vic and Eric. Do we know how other towns handle this, or is it just all over the place? 
Well, I can speak from experience of where it helped was happened before where I worked, and that's how they dealt with it. How? You, you, if you had to account for your 40 hours. You couldn't just leave during the week, and then you had to account whether it was vacation time or whatever. And then if you worked outside of that, that normal work hours, you got paid overtime. But you had to account for your 40 hours one way or another. Including paid time off. Mm -hmm. State of Vermont does that. And I realize the state of Vermont's got a bigger resource of money than, than the town of Middlesex. But I mean, I, I understand that argument exactly. But, but the thing I'd like to see is, like Eric says, I'd just like to sit down and have somebody show me. Right. They, maybe they, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I just don't see it, but that doesn't mean I'm right. Right. That's all I'm saying. We need to, we need to put an end to this for tonight. But if you're, if you end up paying out more overtime than we are now, that's an additional expense, and I think it's likely we would end up paying out more overtime if we administered it in this way. So to me, and if if that's what we want to do, and that's what the majority of the board wants to do. That's fine. I just disagree with it. That's all. And I think it is. I mean, certainly it's an unbudgeted expense for next year, because when we count on overtime, we didn't plan on doing that. It's very hard to quantify how many hours that might be. I don't know if it's, you know, 100 hours of overtime that we otherwise wouldn't have paid or, or what, but it's potentially real money, I think. Well, one thing I will say, though, is you, you can't you can't make up overtime. There's only so much hours of overtime, whether it's available or not. So I don't see how you would pay more out because, for instance, I didn't take any vacation time during the winter, and that's what I got for hours, for overtime hours. If I would have taken a vacation day, it's still the same amount of hours. It hasn't increased anything. There's no more overtime. I think we should, I think we should help. I'll work something out, and I'd be yeah. happy to sit down. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, Treasurer's report. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. That was the easy one. <laughs> um, other business. Ratifying catering permits for the local and all goods eats for summer events at Camp Mead and reauthorizing the town clerk to approve future catering permits action likely. I'll move it. What, Peter moved? Peter moved. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second. Bridget? Yes. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And we are good. So, Sarah, you are approved. You're good to approve future catering permits. Thank you. Um, approving the FY24 annual Washington County Sheriff's Department contract to provide speed patrol in Middlesex. Action likely. Can I say something about this? Yes, Sarah, please. Okay. So, the, uh, we have a new sheriff in town. Ha, ha, ha. And the uh, rates have gone up per hour from $31.25 per hour at the last sheriff to $60 an hour uh, now to, for this new contract. The, um, uh, you also at the same time decreased in your budget the amount to spend on speeding from the sheriffs from $5,000 to $2,500, so you've cut it in half. So if you paid them, if you paid the sheriffs uh, one dollar, I mean, I'm sorry, for one hour per week for 52 weeks, you'd be over budget at thirty three thousand one hundred twenty, right, Dorinda? So do you want me to say eighty cents an hour to keep it on uh, twenty five hundred? Anyway, those are the numbers I'm kicking around. You guys have in the past, uh, Dorinda, how much did we spend last year? We spent right now we're at twenty five hundred. Right now we're at 2,500. You write, you know, one week, two weeks before the end of the fiscal year. So that's the information I'm giving to you. Can, and that was. Can, can we do speed? Can, I thought we had to have a traffic study. No, I thought no, they no. weren't even going to force it. There's, um, there are roads where they're, they're, the traffic is the study's okay. Where the speed. Where is, is that? I don't know. They've been sitting on Center Road a couple times. I've seen them. Which, yeah. my understanding, that's one of the roads that isn't 
eligible. Well, that aside, <laughs> you have a contract here. Do you want to renew it? And if so, how many hours a week do you want to go in? I would think that we'd want to go in for just what we what we have that's, budgeted. Okay, that's point. so for half of the hours. Half the essentially, hour. okay, essentially, it's still, it's still going to put you over budget. Okay. Then yeah. Well, if they show up. Okay. So instead of three hours, you want one one and a half hours per week. Yeah. It seems. How do they justify that rate increase? Just because they say we need it? I guess so. Yeah. Like I said, it's like our language. That rate is, they provided such shady service, and now they double the rates. Expect us just to eat it. One, two, three, four. How about if you do five hours a month? Well, because the contract is written per week. Oh, is it? They don't come per week, though, right? No. Well, How do they bill us? Whenever they want. Yeah. It's just that the contract says the department agrees to furnish deputies for blank hours per week on a regular basis. The hours per week will be determined according to a contract length and the contract amount of $2,500. They never honor their contract. Yeah. I just need to know how to fill it out so you guys can vote on it. So why not do, do a maximum of 78 hours? That's, a, that's an hour and a half a week throughout the year. Say so an hour and a half weeks to, can we modify it to say 78 hours annually or something? Uh, I don't know. It just says no. if you do blank hours per week, and the co weeks. you've already got $2,500. Uh, just do it all in two weeks. Just do it in two weeks and then they won't be around at <laughs> yeah, right. all speed. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's good. there are two conflicting sentences because the first sentence says you, they, they agree to furnish Japanese for X number of hours a week on a regular basis. Then it says the hours worked per week will be determined according to a contract length and the contract amount of $2,500. So it already determines how many hours they're going to work. Yeah, I mean, that's all yeah. they're doing is they're taking, the, they're taking the budget and dividing it by the hours to determine an, right. an average weekly. That's right. all they're that's doing. That's all they're doing. Okay, so do you want to say one hour per week and then $2,500? Yeah, with so, a maximum of, yeah. Oh, we get budgeted. I don't think we can do more than that. Yeah. Okay, well, then that's 0.8 hours per week. So they'll show up for one hour. Yeah. yeah. Okay, 0.8 hours per week. Okay. Hey, it's, it's nothing. <laughs> By the time they get here, they'll be leaving, so they can't, <laughs> they can't accomplish anything in that hour. And then you guys have to vote on it and authorize the signature because Peter's not here. Okay. Oh, no, no, you all have to sign it. Sorry. So we, we just need to, to vote on that, that approval? Yeah. Do we have a motion? So moved. So moved. Okay. Seconded. Wait. So who had the, who had the motion? Uh, uh, Peter and Victor both moved, and they both said second. So <laughs> you pick. <laughs> you pick. Okay. Uh, approving the renewal of the dog stray holding contract with CVHS Action Likely. Um, we just got a bill from them for the year. How much was it for, Dorinda? Uh, two hundred and eighty-nine dollars or something like that and you guys a year. Have, and you have budget. Well, it, it's for it goes by the number of dogs they've held over. So and you guys have budgeted three hundred dollars in the in the upcoming fiscal year. Want to cover it? Yeah. So we have three hundred, and the bill came in at two eighty-nine. So we're good for this year. Oh, there's nothing else you can do. No. And we budgeted next year's at 300 so a lot of years we don't spend any. It depends. It was a bad year right. for dogs. Should, should, should they double their rates? Hopefully not. It's $25, day, $25 daily. Um, <laughs> Things run away every other day. Do we bill, do we bill, if there, two of the dogs are, we don't know where they belong, but one of the owners we do know. Do we go and bill them for the compensation for that $100 for holding their dog? We, we hadn't in the past, I don't think, but. I don't recall ever bailing them. But. I think that's legitimate to bill them if you know who, to, to recoup some of the money. Yeah. Yeah, so it looks like they, CBHS, charged the owners 25 days, or a uh, boarding fee of $50 for the first day, an additional $25 daily after for each calendar day. 
when they go pick them up at the shelter. Um, that they bill the town $100 per canine and $60 per feline turned into CVHS. So they've already paid to go pick up their animal then that's saying. Uh, so it's like a double dipping kind of it's, thing? It sounds that way from what he's reading. Can we to sign that? Yes, please. If they're charging and then the there's an after hours fee of fifty dollars per animal. I think this has always been just like a flat contract thing that we've had with them and but but it sounds like they had to I, pay to pick up their dog, right? I mean maybe we yeah. maybe we've overspent that one or two times, but I can't remember us overspending it, and if we did it was very small money. I, I mean, we need them here to do this. Man. We don't have any other options, so I'm in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Somebody yeah, second. Anybody seconded? Do one of you want to second this? Uh, I second it. Bridges second. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, do you authorize the signatory? Uh, no. Um, I guess we need a signatory for that as well. Can you include that in the motion? Yeah. Yes, I'll amend the motion. Randy can sign it. Is that okay with your second, Bridget? That's fine. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that has passed. Um, we only have two signatures on this contract. Do um, for the uh, signatures to require five. Br Peter, you're not going to be around, right? Bridget, can you be around? Yeah, I can stop by tomorrow. Okay, I'm just going to put it on the counter for you then. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be around next week, Sarah. Don't There's we two. have doctors on? No, not not these paper documents. Okay, great. Okay, Welch Park update. Uh, Action possible. Look into Peter for that. No update. Our attorney, our attorney is working on the documents. Uh, the good news is, tentatively at least, uh, Benderson agreed to our proposal that if we take over the roads, they should continue to provide us with uh, water for our sprinkler system at the fire department. So that's the way the documents are being prepared. Once they're being prepared, they'll be circulated. I'll follow up with uh, Riley again this week because. Time he gets those done. Great. Do you see the light at the end of the tunnel, Dorinda? <laughs> <laughs> when that's signed, sealed, and delivered, I will. <laughs> it, might be the, it might be the train coming the other way, but I think we're getting there, guys. I really do. Okay. Uh, orders. Um, it yeah, we'll need you to sign the orders when you come in tomorrow, Bridget. Because we only have two, only two signatures here. Okay. Uh, we'll any correspondence? Nope. Any other matters uh, coming before the board? I would just apologize again for my tardy arrival, and Randy, I thank you for uh, stepping into the breach. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Just don't put me on the spot anymore. <laughs> we'll just dock your pay, uh, Peter. You don't get any. You don't get any overtime for this, Randy. That's right. That's right. All right. Uh, and with that, uh, adjourn the meeting. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.